Hey everyone, it's Professor Clark. In this lecture, we are going to get a brief overview of some of the most important historical events and personages in the Russian Federation. Uh, it won't be a super long lecture because we are going to be discussing a lot of uh, what's actually going on right now or what has been going on recently in class. But I wanted to give you a quick overview of the bare bones of some of the most important things in the last 30 years. Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin was the president of the Soviet Russian Republic, who then, you know, heroically stood up against the hardliners during the attempted coup in August 1991 and became the president of the newly independent Russian Federation. And again, just as a side note, or an important thing to understand, the Soviet Union was dissolved by an agreement by the presidents of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Uh, not a lot of other people were necessarily consulted, and so this was not popular with everyone. I mean, lots of people, uh, especially in places like the Baltics, had been pushing for independence and the dissolution of the Soviet Union or had already declared independence, uh, but a lot of other people were not happy about it. Nonetheless, it happened, um, and Yeltsin became president of the newly independent Russian Federation. And he was a very sort of um, Western-oriented reformer and brought in a lot of Western consultants who advised him to carry out a series of rapid economic and political reforms that were called shock therapy. And the idea was that you would just remove all the controls from the economy and just in the space of a couple of years transform the Soviet command economy and sort of totalitarian government style into a modern Western capitalist democracy. Well, that didn't happen. These shock therapy reforms resulted in a dramatic drop in the standard of living. There was a dramatic rise in freedom of speech, so that was fun, um, although it often expressed itself as, you know, porn and hate speech and all that kind of stuff. So this was not necessarily felt as a uh, universal or unilateral good. A lot of times it was seen as sort of a bad thing, because a lot of times what people are secretly wanting to say is not stuff that should be said. So the freedom of speech thing was sort of a mixed blessing. Uh, the dramatic drop in the standard of living, um, as well as the widespread crime and corruption and the utter plundering of the Russian Federation's natural resources, uh, was seen as a very bad thing. So Yeltsin became very unpopular, his reforms were very unpopular, and Western-style capitalist democracy became very unpopular. And this is important to understand, sort of like in the West, we, we have a really hard time understanding sometimes like why Russia sort of won't get with the program and do what we want and support us now. And one of the reasons is that they felt like horribly betrayed and led astray by these really brutal and cruel shock therapy reforms in the 90s that plunged huge numbers of people into abject poverty and almost destroyed the country. One of the interesting things about the collapse of the Soviet Union is that it was much less bloody and violent than people were expecting or fearing. There was some violence, uh, for example, in Tajikistan, and then, of course, the Caucasus created a lot of violence, but there was a lot less violence than people were originally fearing, and there is a school of thought that says... The violence that has been taking place in Ukraine for the past eight years and that is currently taking place all over Ukraine is sort of uh, an overdue reaction to the collapse of the Soviet Union. And this was the violence, I don't want to say sh that should have happened, but that was expected to happen 30 years ago and then it didn't and it's happening now. But overall, it was a remarkably peaceful and bloodless transformation but one of the big exceptions were the Chechen Wars. So Chechnya is this republic within Russia. So Russia is a federation made up of republics, just like the Soviet Union was a federation made up of republics, kind of like how 
The U.S. is a republic made up of states. Russia is a republic made up or is a federation made up of republics. And Chechnya is this republic within Russia in the North Caucasus or sort of down near the Black Sea. And it had been brutally conquered by Russia in the 18th century uh, and never was very happy about this. And the people there are ethnically not Slavic and they are not normally Christian. They are Muslim. And it declared independence in 1991 and then sort of like things happened. Russia kind of ignored it, hoped the problem would go away. Well, it didn't. Um, In 1994, Russian forces moved in to put down the revolt there. And this turned into a very bloody war that essentially ended in defeat for Russian federal forces. I mean, Chechnya was not declared to be a sovereign nation. It was not recognized as a sovereign nation by anyone. But the Russian federal forces have actually kind of had to retreat out of Chechnya and negotiate with them. And Chechnya had a lot of de facto independence after this happened in 1996. So this was a very humiliating defeat for the Russian federal forces and sort of highlighted how bad things had become and how bad the 90s were and how much these reforms were, in most people's eyes, damaging Russia. And another war broke out, a second Chechen war broke out in 1999, and it dragged on for about another 10 years. Uh, The heavy fighting uh, was during the first years, 1999 to 2000, um, and then there was sort of low-key fighting for another eight or nine years. And it saw Chechnya basically brought back under Russian control, and it's still a part of Russia, although, interestingly, it's very autonomous, and they have sort of their own laws. So it is a Muslim region, and they have essentially imposed Sharia law there, for example. And these wars were infamous uh, because they were so brutal and horrible, and both sides... um, committed absolutely hideous atrocities. So on the Russian side, uh, in the Second War, they decided the gloves were off, especially after the NATO bombing of Belgrade in 1999. They were like, heck, NATO can like come in and do high altitude bombing of urban areas. We should do it too. And so they completely flattened Grozny, uh, the capital of Chechnya, and it was seen as the most, most destroyed city on earth. And this picture here is a picture of federal troops raising a Russian flag over, you know, the destroyed rubble of what had once been Grozny, the capital city. On the Chechen side, they did things like take a maternity ward hostage, take a school hostage, take a theater hostage. Uh, They committed like really brutal and terrifying terrorist activities. Um, And they were also backed by... Saudi Islamist radicals. And so this was seen as part of the global war on terror. And so Russia's extremely brutal actions in Chechnya were largely overlooked by the West because they were doing this against extremist-backed Muslims with ties to al-Qaeda and organizations like that. And so this was seen as kind of like the US and Russia had this common cause. Another interesting thing um, as far as what's going on today is that veterans of both sides of the Chechen wars then went on almost immediately to fight on both sides of the conflict in Ukraine. And so you have like Chechen legions fighting and you currently have Chechen legions fighting on both sides of the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, You have Russians fighting on both sides who were veterans of the Chechen wars. And they sort of what a lot of these veterans have said is that it's sort of like it gave them a taste for war and now they just need more war. So this is my area of research. So this is why I'm going on and on about it. But one of the things you can see, I think, is how these extremely brutal wars traumatized and brutalized society and then made people more willing to foment violence in Ukraine. In the final slide, we're going to talk a little bit about Vladimir Putin, and I'm sure you've read a lot about him and have a lot of opinions, but I wanted to talk about him a little bit because I think there's a lot of potentially misleading information about him in the Western press and specifically about how Russians actually view him. So Yeltsin stepped down on December 31st, 1999, and named Putin, who at that point was a relative unknown, as acting president. And Putin inherited a shaky economy 
a uh, deeply dissatisfied, uh, traumatized populace, raging corruption, and this really ugly civil war in Chechnya. And under his administration, Chechnya was brought under control. The Russian economy and standard of living increased dramatically. And I wouldn't say that corruption was ended, but he did reduce corruption and bring down some of the worst oligarchs. At the same time, his administration became increasingly authoritarian with the infamous vertical of power that he discussed and increasing restrictions on freedom of speech. However, it is important to remember that uh, despite that, it is still the freest that Russia has almost ever been. So despite these repressions on freedom of speech that are currently taking place, Russia is still much freer than it has been um, at almost any point in its previous history, and its standard of living has risen dramatically. So this perhaps helps explain, and this is something that a lot of Westerners have a really hard time wrapping their heads around, that Putin has consistently been one of the most popular world leaders amongst his own people for the past 20 years. And although there is probably some corruption at the polls during elections, and probably the results are massaged a little bit, uh, he probably does win legitimately. And the consistent 60 to 80% approval ratings that the Russian populace gives him are probably fairly accurate. And he is incredibly popular and has been for a very long time. And it's just important to understand that he is in fact very popular with most Russians and that there are genuine reasons for this as far as improving the economy and the standard of living, uh, making Russia a great power again, and bringing more stability to Russia's internal affairs. So that concludes our series of, you know, very quick and dirty lectures on Russian history. I hope you found that helpful, and I will see you in class.